Tonight, as I mentioned, I want to talk about accepting other people. And this is easy when other people are highly likable, lovable, they keep all their agreements, they load the dishwasher in the right way, they drive correctly, they use their turn signals, they, they return your calls, they respond to emails immediately, they never say anything rude on Facebook, they vote the same way you do, they agree entirely with you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm speaking of my own mind stream as well here. That's easy, but how do we appreciate the value of acceptance? How do we enjoy the inner freedom of acceptance and the ways in which acceptance fosters skillfulness in dealing with others, how can we claim that for ourselves? How can we authentically experience it while recognizing wrongdoing, while having understandable reactions to other people who mistreat us or others, while in some cases being completely appalled by what people are doing? Can we also rest in a fundamental spaciousness of acceptance meanwhile? How can we possibly do that? So that's what I, I hope to explore with you tonight. And as I've said before, if you like, you're welcome to use the chat feature. Uh, just push the chat button at the bottom of the Zoom screen and it'll open that sidebar. If you don't wanna see the chat, just push that button. Uh, if it somehow bothers you that other people are using the chat while you're not, um, you know, that, that could be what a friend of mine calls an OFP, an opportunity for practice. Uh, and if there's something distracting, which is understandable, and the numbers increasing in the chat button at the bottom of the screen, just move your Zoom window down so you don't see that chat button. Um, for myself, I find the chats helpful. Uh, I'm okay with other people practicing in different ways. And uh, the chat sidebar does give people a chance to experience a sense of community sometimes with each other. I do ask that if you use the chat feature, you do so without judgment, without pronouncements, and without um, criticizing other people. Okay, so accepting other people. Uh, I wanna begin by saying that it's really important, I think, to distinguish acceptance from discernment, valuing, and planning. We can retain the right and the capacity and the implementation of seeing what we see, valuing what we value, and planning what we plan with conditions that we also accept. As we've explored previously, we can do that with our experiences. That was the week before last. We can do it with all the parts of ourselves. That was last week. And if you have any issues with self-acceptance, you might want to listen to that talk and that meditation again, perhaps. And as I'll explore next week, we can distinguish seeing what we see, valuing what we value, and planning what we plan, while also coming to a wise acceptance of conditions in the world really broadly. So that's my first key point here and to kind of separate these out. Now in practice, it's easier said than done, I get that, but I wanna emphasize that acceptance does not mean waiving our rights um, <clears throat> or our responsibility for seeing what we see, valuing what we value, and planning what we plan. Second point, a major factor, which is what I wanna move into now, of accepting things that are hard to accept in other people, including people sometimes, I could speak for myself here, that you love dearly in your own family system. Um, a major factor of acceptance of others is your own well-being. When we feel like we're running on empty, we're just knocked around by the world, we, 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 don't, we, we haven't found our footing, we've lost our footing, when that's the case, it's a lot harder to be accepting. On the other hand, when we feel like our own personal cup runneth over, we have a sense of basic well-being, basic okayness that we're in touch with, we're, we're touching it, we're maintaining contact with it, then when they do that thing, small or large, um, when they do that thing of chewing with their mouth open, or they do that thing of making that weird noise that you initially found charming on your first date, 
and now, after 20 years of marriage, drives you crazy. Or scaling up from there. When they do that thing, or you observe in them that yet again, inside their mind, they're X or Y, yet again, it's a lot easier to have a spaciousness about it and an acceptance for it when you're staying in touch with your well-being. That's why in the meditation, I really emphasized cultivating an ongoing contact with a fundamental, foundational, basic all rightness. Now, to be clear, this basic all rightness can include or can, can include pain, terrible physical pain, illness, impairment, and great difficulty. And as an example of this, I want to tell a story from a friend of mine, Vidya Mala Birch, B-U-R-C-H, who has had chronic, really horrible pain most of her life. Developed when she was a teenager, as an athlete. Um, uh, it's something she's had to practice with much of her life. And she teaches what's called breath works, which is a way of dealing with pain. Uh, you can apply it certainly to emotional pain. Her own roots are in physical pain. And one of the stories that she tells about herself is that when she was in the hospital yet again for yet another uh, surgery on her spine, uh, she was in horrible agonizing pain. She had to maintain a certain position so she couldn't shift to get out of that pain. And as she imagined her future, it just seemed unbearable. She thought to herself, is this my fate? as a young woman in my early 20s? Is this my fate? Uh, am I stuck with this forever? I mean, just overwhelming, suicidal levels of despair. And, and then as she talks about this, um, she says she suddenly realized that all she had to do was to get through the next moment. Just the next moment, in the present, breath after breath. And the realization of that, that all she had to do was to be able to bear the next moment and to be with the next moment was enormously liberating for her. And while her back was still killing her, there was a tremendous wave of release and all rightness moving through her. And she found a way to rest in a fundamental all rightness in the present as experiences occur. So it's a very important point. And a lot of practice and uh, personal development in general is about training in the capacity to stay in touch with an underlying well-being, no matter what is arising in the mind, the body, or the world. Again, easier said than done, but to be clear, People who have cultivated this kind of practice have often done so in the middle of great poverty, great difficulty, great uncertainty. Um, it's doable. And you can start to feel, maybe characterized as that metaphor I offered of a flower, the kind of opening. It's not so much a scratching and clawing to well-being, that's effortful and straining and striving, which of course obstructs well-being, it's more like a falling open to an underlying ongoingness of the body, an ongoing livingness, an ongoing um, spaciousness of awareness that continues no matter what passes through it. And maybe there could be a sense of opening into something that feels almost impersonal, deep, deeper than your ordinary personality. And if you relate to it, perhaps even opening into something that's transpersonal, ultimately transcendental, or not. So there's this establishing of a basic well being. And this is a very important training. It's really fundamental to train. It's a sweet training. <laughs> it's like a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it. Train in a continuity of well being so that you can take refuge in it. It's like a home base. No matter what craziness is going on around you, and even when you get distracted from this basic well-being, it's being able to return to it or to find it again 
even if you take need to take some breaths to find it again, you need a cup of tea to find it again, you need a hug from a friend, you need a good night's sleep, you need a shower, you need a walk, you need dinner to find it again, but it's it's accessible. This is a home base. You can come home again to. Very important factor of accepting difficulty in other people. And when you're in the middle of something difficult with another person, or if you think about them, can you get in touch with this underlying well-being while dealing with uh, being aware of whatever you find hard to accept, whatever's irksome, annoying, frustrating, scary, alarming, disappointing, yet again, right? Try to be in touch with this core of well-being while you're also aware of all that other stuff. That will really support acceptance. Second, know what healthy resignation feels like. And I invite you to think of a specific example for you where there's some condition in your life that you wished was different or you've tried to deal with. And then you get to a point where you just resign to it. It could be um, like you're back in the day when we were flying routinely in airplanes, uh, your flight's delayed and you've got to sit there at the airport for 40 extra minutes. Or I've got gophers in our backyard. No need to send me suggestions, although I've gone through, <laughs> worked through a lot. I'm moving to resignation. Gopher's just going to gopher. <laughs> You're just going to do gophering. <laughs> You're going to be gophery. Uh, Ajahn Chah, uh, the great teacher of teachers uh, in th from Thailand, uh, has a story in his book, uh, Being Dharma, a beautiful story, where in this very rural setting, he's talking to villagers who are really angry about the monkeys in Thailand in the forest coming in through their windows and stealing the food. And he was just sort of laughing with them, you know, because he was in that environment as well. And he's like, monkey's going to monkey. <laughs> That's not what he said, but he a little more eloquent, but he said it basically that. It's just, that's the way it is. So know what it's like to be, to just kind of resign to something. You wish it was different. You're not saying it's great. You're not altering your discernment of its nature or the ways that it's not good in terms of values. And you retain a plan. My plan is to redo a little part of my garden with a little bit of mesh underneath it all and then plant on top of it to keep the gophers out and then give up otherwise. <laughs> That's my plan. But at least I have a plan. But it's but there's resignation. It's like, yeah, they're like that. You know? Um, in a long-term relationship, you just develop a kind of healthy resignation that your partner really is just never going to see the light. <laughs> <laughs> they're just never going to not do that thing. Or they're never honestly going to really want something that you want maybe a lot, and it's just not their nature to want very much. It's just not a natural priority for them. Maybe they can call themselves to some engagement with it for your sake, which is to be appreciated. But in their heart, it's just not their nature to love opera or maybe other things as well. So know what healthy resignation feels like. Get a sense of that. Get a sense of healthy resignation and what that feels like. Know what that's like. That can serve acceptance. Okay. Third resource for accepting other people um, is, is really deep and insightful. And... Um, So when we say other people, what is a people? What is a person? You're a person, I'm a person. What are we, really? And this can start a little conceptually, but it becomes and opens into, in a very felt way, the felt recognition of the actual nature of all persons. This felt realization, this felt insight is actually central in Buddhist practice for whatever that's worth. The, the Buddha really valued this insight as a major factor of liberation from suffering 
and a fundamental freedom. So it's the recognition, to cut to the chase, that all persons have these three fundamental aspects. One, they're dynamic. They're not just static. They're like, you know, they're moving. They're liquid. They're fluid. They're impermanent. Second, they're compounded. They're made up of parts. So if you think about someone in your life who's a significant person to you, who you probably may not accept entirely as they are. And so you think about them, they're made up of many parts. They have many motives. They have many moods. Uh, they have many qualities. They have many residues from life experiences. They have pluses. They have minuses. They have strengths. They have weaknesses. They have assets. They have liabilities. They have vulnerabilities. Many different qualities in them. They're made up of many parts, like many threads. And to continue the metaphor of a dynamically changing tapestry that is a person with many threads, ripples passing through it, the momentary ripple that you may not like arises based on vast webs of causes and conditions. All kinds of factors. I think of it as the 10,000 causes upstream of this particular way this other person is being. And so in the technical terminology, we can recognize the emptiness of all persons, including ourselves, existing. There's a fullness amidst the emptiness, but we are cloud-like. We are like eddies in a stream, patterning reality, swirling along as we go, containing smaller eddies that contain even smaller eddies biologically and psychologically, we are all eddies within larger eddies, within larger eddy, eddies within Earth as an eddy, within the solar system as an eddy, within the galaxy, Milky Way galaxy as an eddy, all the way out into the Big Bang universe itself as a blossoming eddy amidst mystery. Eddies in the stream. And when we start to regard other people in this way, in this larger way, this airier kind of way. There's space between the dynamically quivering threads in the tapestry of allness that is that other person. They don't seem so burdensome, and it's easier to accept what we have found unacceptable. So, um, and there's a traditional story, a teaching story in the Taoist tradition uh, that I'm going to update slightly uh, that illustrates this point and the benefits of recognizing all persons as, in effect, dynamic eddies in the stream that are empty of fixed substance, that are dynamic and cloud-like in their nature. So the story is, imagine that you decided to go for a, a canoe ride in a slowly moving river on a Sunday beautiful afternoon with a friend, maybe your sweetheart, uh, and you got all dressed up for it and you prepared a picnic and you brought grandmother's silverware, special silverware, and you're just having a great, great time. There you are just having a wonderful time in your canoe, drifting slowly down the stream. And then suddenly, kaboom, there's a loud thump on the side of your canoe that tips you over into the cold river. And you come up sputtering and, you know, your clothes are ruined, your hair's wrecked, Grandma Silver's the bottom of the river. And what do you see? You see two teenagers with snorkel and fins have snuck up on your boat and tipped you over and they're just laughing and laughing. How do you feel? Okay. Now take two. Everything's the same. Um, river, canoe, Sunday afternoon, picnic, you're having a wonderful time. You're all dressed up. You did your hair. Everything's great. Grandma the silver. You know, you're having a wonderful silverware. You're having a wonderful time. Suddenly a loud thump. Boom. Canoe tips over. You're dumped into the river. Clothes are ruined. Silverware in the bottom of the stream. And you come to the surface. Uh, what do you see? You see that a large submerged log has drifted downstream, bonked your canoe, and dumped you in the river. How do you feel? And what's the difference between take one and take two? 
Well, a lot the difference is that with the log, we don't take it so personally. We don't attribute intention to the log. The conditions are the same. Everything is exactly the same. Same amount of coldness, same amount of ruination of the day, uh, same amount of lost precious silverware. But we have a different orientation to it because in the log, we recognize the um, emptiness of what happened, the fact that it occurred due to many, many causes, many, many factors. Uh, we don't take it so personally. And in much the same way, we can take the things that bother us about other people much less personally. We can understand that actually other people very often that are bumping into us um, are like logs launched due to 10,000 causes upstream. And maybe amidst the many factors, you know, the currents that led them to be there in that way are, are some intentions inside them, some failures to respect you or support you or treat you well, acknowledging all that. We're not giving up discerning what we discern, seeing what we see, knowing what we know. We're not giving that up at all. But it's just amidst all this other stuff. When you start to look at other people in this complex, dynamic, distributed, you know, like rippling through the tapestry of reality kind of way, it's a lot easier to accept it. Other people are more like logs very much. And then um, another thing we can do as I kind of move to an end here, and I'm going to open it up for discussion uh, and see what you have to say. And you can see what other people and, you know, can see um, is that um, in the recognition of emptiness, classically, and this deepens, becomes very felt. You just begin to see reality in this way. There's this uncanny natural movement into compassion. So whether it comes from a very felt insight into emptiness in the technical sense, uh, whether compassion arises from that, you know, the metaphor of the jewel and the lotus, um, uh, or whether compassion for the other is something more actively practiced, such as deliberately mobilizing compassion for another person, doesn't we mean we agree with them, doesn't mean we approve of them. Um, you know, just knowing that, that they're suffering too, that maybe they're suffering the way of being that we have a hard time accepting. Maybe they're suffering our lack of acceptance. You know, they're being affected by that as well. Uh, and we can also have compassion for ourselves in what, how this is all landing on, on us. So that's the fourth factor that I'm naming here, compassion that can help us to accept other people. So we have the first factor of being able to be in touch with your own well-being and deepening it as a trait so you can access it more and more readily, this kind of foundational sense of basic all rightness. Second, uh, the recognition of complexity, of emptiness, of all that is. And actually that was third, because second was healthy resignation, knowing what healthy resignation feels like. And then fourth, compassion. And then last, fifth, know what your plan is. What's your plan? Is your plan with the gophers in your life to do what you can in one little spot and then otherwise, you know, disengage and let it be and, you know, do damage control, you know, or you, you let it affect you less? Um, is your plan to shrink that relationship? Uh, is your plan to really ask that other person to please change that thing, even while you're resigned to the reality of it in a healthy way meanwhile? Uh, maybe that's your plan. Maybe your plan is to get counsel from other people. Hey, have you seen this thing? What do you think about it? Do you think they're doing it on purpose? Are they, is that person really targeting me? Or is it just kind of how they are? And it's like a condition, like a storm, uh, like rain that I just have to deal with. It's not so personal. You know, make a plan. Know what your plan is so that you have a sense of agency and you know what you're going to do about it. It could be um, how do you 
intend to cope with a shocking loss that is still the case and the fact. Can you make a plan to feel the feelings, to bear the pain, to keep on putting one foot in front of another as you get through this hour, this day, this week, this month, this year. Maybe that's your plan. Maybe your plan is to be kind to yourself meanwhile. Maybe your plan is to remind yourself to be aware of things that are still beautiful, still good, still supportive in this world, and other things as well. So know what your plan is. It's a lot easier uh, to um, accept other people if you're if you're clear about what your practice is and what your intentions are and what you know. In other words, in other aspects of of your plan, what your actions your 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 actions will be in thought, word, and deed. Um, it's a lot easier, you know, to accept situations while you have a plan, including perhaps a plan to hopefully change the conditions for the better. Okay. Good. So, questions, comments, feedback, what you think about all this? I'm going to take a look at the chats coming in. Very good. So Rana asks a very fundamental question. I'm having a hard time understanding how to get in touch with the core well-being. You know, what is best all rightness? Absolutely fundamental. So um, <clears throat> I think it's really important to be able to come to a very simple, fundamental sense of basic all rightness that is not based on external conditions. So for example, while breathing, there can be a sense of enough air in the present. So basic all rightness also is in the present. So it's about coming into the present. When we're anxious, it's anticipatory. It's about the future. Or if we're upset or resentful or regretful, that's about the past. In the present, is there beingness? Is there livingness? Is there awareness? So getting in touch with the ongoing livingness of the body, maybe through the breath, or just a sense of basic vitality, that's a way in. Simple pleasures, like you know, putting a knuckle on your lip, which might feel soothing to you, or a sense of something that tastes good, or smells good, or feels good. Or I like the color purple. <laughs> the shirt that my wife got me. It's a nice color. I like purple. Really simple. That will draw you into basic all rightness. Maybe in this all rightness can be a sense of your own good intentions. You have a basic warm heartedness. There's a basic goodness in you. Um, you know, these are all ways in to the sense of it. And it's also really useful to repeatedly practice what I talk about. Uh, petting the lizard, feeding the mouse, and hugging the monkey, metaphorically about the three-stage evolution of the brain, inner lizard, mouse, and monkey, reptilian, mammalian, primate, human. In other words, repeatedly taking the good of experiences of basic calm, calm strength, and through repeatedly internalizing states of calm strength and peacefulness, you will develop the trait of this, the trait of inner peace. Similarly, repeatedly internalizing experiences of gratitude, thankfulness, accomplishment, one little goal after another, one dish done after another, one step taken after another, you will internalize many experiences of satisfaction and build up an internal core of feeling satisfied already, even as you aspire and dream big dreams. And through repeatedly internalizing experiences of love, broadly, flowing in and out in all its forms, Caring, warm-heartedness, open-heartedness, kindness, friendliness, decency, respect, appreciation, flowing in and flowing out. As you repeatedly internalize experiences of that, you build up the trait of self-worth, of feeling loved and feeling unconditionally loving 
in your core. These are, these are ways that really work, grounded in positive neuroplasticity. You are really internalizing these experiences, pardon me, over time, um, so they become part of you. These are ways into this. And if you want more about that, you might want to check out my book, Hardwiring Happiness. Um, also, the one-year program I have, The Foundations of Well-Being, which has scholarships for people with genuine financial need. Um, that that's another way to develop these things. But the, the question from Rana is, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, is absolutely fundamental. It's great. It's really important. Well-being is skillful means. It's not, you're not lying about pain. You're not lying about other stuff, but it's kind of like, what are you in touch with, right? As the storm waves pass on through. Okay. Can I speak to empty? What do I mean? Yeah, that's a, many people banging on that one. That's a classic notion. So um, it's, if you look at an experience, it's helpful to start with an experience, like a sensation, like a sensation in your elbow. And you start to look closely and you realize, oh, that sensation is changing. It, it's sort of dynamic. It's like has a buzzing, vibrating, quivering kind of quality to it. It's, it's impermanent. It's not permanently always the same. It has that quality. Second, that sensation in the elbow, it has many little sub-sensations, many little parts to it. We observe this. We see this directly when we're mindful of our experience. We also recognize that, oh, that sensation, those sensations that are compounded, they're made up of parts and dynamic, they're impermanent. Um, they're, um, they are not independent. They occur based on all kinds of causes and conditions, including just the evolution of the human body and the structure of our elbows and the nerve endings there. When you recognize all experiences in this way, when you recognize an experience in this way, you start to get drawn into a sense of its existent emptiness. It seems empty of absolute self-existence. It seems empty of substance. Experiences seem um, insubstantial. They're there, but th they don't seem so weighty. They don't seem so brick-like and burdensome. And they seem ownerless, in effect. There's no director of the show who's producing all the little dynamically changing over a time course of tenths of a second sensations in the area of your elbow. There's no self who's screenwriting and directing that movie of that experience. Whoa. And then by extension, you start to become aware of this fact. Oh, it's, it's like, it really, it's true. The nature of the experience of sensations in the elbow, the nature of pulling up a memory I, from last week or this year or your childhood, a happy memory, a sad memory, um, any kind of experience, they all have these three characteristics, which means fundamentally they all have this quality of, in the technical sense, emptiness. And the point of that is that when we can regard people who bug us <laughs> as like cloud-like passing phenomena uh, that are real and got to be dealt with, you know, you got to maybe avoid them the next time or something. But when we regard things that way, it's not so heavy, really. We lighten up about it. And this, this, is, a very, this is an aspect of deep practice. And one of the things I try to do here in our weekly gatherings um, <clears throat> is something that wasn't really the case in most of the, my early experience of learning about Buddhist practice. I'm very interested in the combination here of things that are real practical, immediate go-tos, like take a full breath or exhale slowly because it's going to slow your heart rate. Great. But also really going after intermediate and even advanced aspects of practice, which include this deepening recognition of the emptiness of all experiences and the emptiness as well, and very similarly of almost all things. It's kind of wild that all thoughts and all things have the same nature. Impermanent, compounded, dependently arising, and thus empty of essence and substance.
That's pretty darn cool. Okay. Other questions, comments? Anything? Um, how about stuff that's practical? Uh, I'm going to talk about con accepting the world, you know, as America approaches a national election in the next 10 days or so. Um, I'm going to talk about that next week. So I just put that out there. Yeah. Ah, so how do we manage acceptance? How do we maintain a quality of acceptance in situations where we can't get away from it? Maybe a family gathering, right? We, we, we're, we're there. And I'll tell you a couple of things that, that have really helped me uh, is to kind of adopt a stance of interest and not knowing, almost as if you're an anthropologist from Mars. <laughs> Come to Earth observing the strange tribal customs <laughs> of these tall bipedal monkeys. What? You know, they have hair on the top of their head and elsewhere. You know, like what? And um, like, and then this particular creature, Uncle Bob, or your ex husband, something, ex spouse, something, or whoever, right? And oh, why are they like that? Isn't that interesting that they're like that? What's going on in their mind that they're like that? Isn't that interesting? That, that's kind of helpful, I find, that the quality of curiosity and not knowing and det detached curiosity, like, in, like an anthropologist, observing the customs and qualities of a, of a very curious being. That's one. Another um, is to keep reminding yourself that you're not implicated in their mind stream. It may affect you. You may have to deal with the consequences of it. You know, you may have to deal with the fact that there you are stuck in a situation that isn't very pleasant at all, but you're not implicated. That's a funny kind of word to use, but for me, it was really helpful to realize I'm not necessarily implicated in their mind stream. Their thoughts are their thoughts. And you, you start to realize, I mean, it helps to even think about it neurologically, like what is their thought? Like we get uptight about their thought about us, right? Their evaluation of us or their their read of us, their their appraisal of us, like they think we need their advice, or they, they think we're doing our life wrong, they think our choices are bad, they think we're bad, they think we're a real schmuck, you know, like whatever it might be, right? That's their thoughts about us, for example. And um, what are those thoughts? I mean, they're very transient, insubstantial, eddy in the stream of the mind, basically in a stream of information processing, underpinned by very transient, gooey, neurochemical, molecular, microscopic processes in the amygdala. We're not so implicated, are we? When we start to kind of regard what's there in that way. And that's helpful. It's, you know, the Buddha was a pre-modern, post-modernist, deconstructing. That's the strategy partly of the inside of emptiness. We're disentangling the seemingly knotted, stiff, brick-like threads of a thing that really bugs us. And we're deconstructing it. We're disentangling the threads and airing them out and letting some light shine through, which helps us suffer less and often helps us be better people toward other people and less judgmental, less angry about it, less reactive, less <laughs> positional ourselves, right? When we when we have this kind of regard for them, um, including, you know, realizing that these thoughts that bug us so much, what is their actual nature? Quivering ephemeral patterns of electrochemical activation that underlie insubstantial streams of information. Okay. okay, maybe one more. I like this one, uh, an Iowa-ism. Avoid wrestling with hogs. Everyone gets covered with barnyard mud and the hog likes it. Uh, I think that's the G-rated expression there. You can imagine the R-rated way of describing that. Um, let's see here. 
so let's see, da 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 da. Uh, exactly right. We don't have to buy into other people's stuff necessarily. Um, well, this I'm going to finish on this one. Uh, can I address when others are actively harming? Yeah, maybe small ways, maybe large ways, are actively harming. Um, so how do we hold on to a sense of acceptance of the fact of their harming while doing what we can to prevent it or stop it? Or if need be, seek justice, which might include punishment for it. How do we include all that? I want to say first that sometimes in the moment, you can't get in touch with acceptance. In the moment, you're running from the fire, you're swerving to avoid the car, you're pushing back firmly against someone who's really assaulting you or another person verbally or physically, you know, forget acceptance <laughs> in the moment, <laughs> you know, like you're, you're dealing with it. So give yourself a break about that, uh, first point. Second, uh, <clears throat> keep reminding yourself that we can face the reality of something. We can face the reality of something, which is what acceptance really is about. We can, it is, forgive me using this phrase that other people have used, it is what it is. There it is. You know, the stick broke. The center did not hold. The car swerved. The, the friend got an illness. Uh, you know, the, the crime occurred. The crime is still occurring in plain sight. There it is. We can reduce our friction. You know, this is where healthy resignation is such a great teacher because you realize that like, if I'm all hot and bothered about my gophers, that's not going to reduce the gophering <laughs> in the yard. They go, gophers going to gopher. <laughs> they don't care. So it just makes me suffer more. And it actually makes it harder for me to be skillful. So it really is helpful to recognize the distinction with healthy resignation where we, we accept the reality of what we don't like while mobilizing ourselves to deal with it in whatever ways we can. And this can help us you know, uh, be able to accept the fact. And I actually find that there's a part of us that arises, and I'm finished on this point. Sometimes when other, do, when other people do certain things, we just can't believe it. Like there's an innocence in us or a goodness in us or a naivete in us, or we just didn't see it coming. Like, really? We like, or it's so unthinkable that they would do that. We're like, and that quality, even if it's kind of tender and sweet in some cases, that, that childlike innocence or seeing always the best in other people, that is not complete acceptance of the fact of it on the ground. It is what it is. It is the way it is right there. And so... Moving into this quality of actual acceptance, including healthy resignation, can help us cope more effectively and be more realistic. As Maya Angelou famously put it, the first time people, the first time someone shows you who they are, believe them, right? And, you know, there's a kind of waking up and becoming disenchanted from a childlike spell of, of hopeful innocence. Okay. Huge topic. Big, 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 big topic. And how about we just sit for a minute here, letting it sink in, maybe touching again, which each time we do it reinforces the sense of it, that underlying okayness in your innermost being. Which I think has qualities of awareness, ongoingness, peacefulness, contentment, and love. Thank you very much for coming to my birthday party. 